This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. George Camel, Ramsey personality, host of The Fine Print on Ramsey Networks, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your relationships, your money your mental health issues, your family. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a subject. And, of course, your money is always. So career, we'll, we'll dip it in. We'll dip into all of it here. It's what we do. Again, 888-825-5225. Adam's in Philadelphia. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. How's it going? Great, man. What's up? Um, nothing much. I, I guess uh, I just have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Um. So the question is about downsizing. Um, It appears that my wife and I have bought a little bit too much house and we've been here for two years and we're sort of looking at the future and thinking, is it good to downsize to accomplish our financial goals? Okay. Based Um, on the fact that your house payment is killing you or what? So right now our house is about 30% of our, um, take home in a month on a 30 year mortgage. And that's with both of our income. And my wife, we had two children and we're expecting more on the way. So she's thinking about transitioning to the home. And, um, it just appears that obviously I'm not gonna be able to cover this on my own. So I don't know if this is something crazy to think about, or if we should really be considering this downsize. Yeah. Well, I think you've already answered the question, haven't you? If, if she's going to stay I, I home, have. if she's going to stay home, you can't pay the payment. Didn't you just tell me that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not that it's not that she needs to stay home, but it's obviously something that she would like to do. And I don't know. I, I guess I just want to know, is it insane to think like in our journey to get out of debt, is it, but also be able to enjoy our life and enjoy our children and things like that, that we give up a home. Um, a lot of our friends and family are thinking we're crazy to do that, to downsize when we moved into a... a Unless they're going to pay the payment, they don't get a vote. <laughs> I guess that's true. They're not experiencing the stress that you guys will experience. So what would the, the percentage of your take-home pay be if she stays home? What, what do you make? So I make about 60000 and she makes about 65000 okay. a year. So it's got, your house now payment's going to be 60% of your take-home pay. You're going to go bankrupt. And that's my concern. Yeah, you and can't. So you, you have to decide. Is she going to stay at, jo- at the job to keep this house, or is she going to stay home and you move? There's really no other option. No, you're right. You're Adam, right. Do you guys have any other type of debt? No. So we are out of debt, um, and we've been really, like, chugging away, um, tucking money away to try to pay off this house and or at least start putting money toward paying this off early. But we're also feeling the pressure from it. She went on maternity leave. And uh, that was three some odd months where we were dipping into our emergency savings and not putting money towards, you know, investments and towards the house. And yeah. that's when I really got thinking about it. Well, you're going to burn, yeah, you're going to yeah. burn through that, and then, then you're going to get foreclosed on if you just ignore this. Okay. Right? So yeah, I think. I you think gotta, you got you got to decide. I, I personally think, it's just a personal opinion, but everybody gets to have one. Uh, it sounds like her desire what you what you stated was her desire is to be at home with the kids, right? Yeah. And if that's what she wants to do, and you all, that's your value system, I think you'll come out fine by moving down in house. And what you're doing is you're trading a, a smaller house for the opportunity to stay home with your kids when they're small. And I think that's a great trade on as a value system. We're putting kids ahead of houses. I like that trade. Yeah, yeah. I think I do too. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, I just needed... But yeah, but you can't do both. Yeah, you, you, it's not an no, option. You don't have the math to do both, and so don't sit there in denial and then just let this sneak up on you and go, "Oh, well, look what happened." You know, don't don't be caught off guard. This is a you you need to make a definite decision that says the price 
of her being at home is a smaller home that we can afford, regardless of what our friends and family think. We're not asking their opinion. She wants to be home with the kids. I want her to be home with the kids. The kids want to be home with the kids. It's a good thing for mom to be home with the kids. We like this. This is a good value. It lines up with who we are as people. This is you saying all of these things. Then you trade a smaller house for that. And I've had lots of friends that have done that over the years. And, and then maybe when the kids take off to elementary school, maybe she kicks back into her professional career and you change, you change gears again six years from now, eight years from now, whatever. This reminds me why we teach what we teach around the parameters of getting a house. 15-year fixed rate, no more than 25% of your take-home pay, put 10 to 20% down because it gives you those options. Because at that point, you've got a lot of margin to do the baby steps. And if someone wants to stay home, it's not going to destroy your financial world. So what I hate to see is, is couples like this who they want to have one stay home, but it's eating up so much of their take-home pay that would crush them if they make a move like this. With the number of times in 30 years of sitting here in this chair that I've taken uh, a call that sounds like, oh, I got this van payment, and I, so I can't afford to to quit and be home with the kids and the lady's like crying and I want to be home with my kids. And I'm like, well, don't trade your van for a kid. It's a trade. Sell the van. That's easy. Well, I can't be without the van. Well, you, you can't do both. I mean, this is, you're not, you're not Congress. You, you want to have, you have to make a choice and eat it too. Yeah. You have to make a choice. You have to make some math here and, and just go, but you know, sometimes people don't even think they go, gosh, if I got rid of the van, I could do this. And well, oh, ding, it's like set free like him. He's like, because you know what they're going to do. You could hear it. What's He's he going? What's he going to do? He's going to sell that house and downsize. He is because she wants to be home and he likes the idea and, and they're in agreement and they're, everybody else's opinions. Well, whatever. He's willing to do what it takes to get what they really want. Yeah, it, it is pretty amazing the number of people that that give you opinions about your money that don't have any money, well, and that aren't gonna, and that aren't going to help you pay payments. So yeah, yeah. I mean, what are you crazy selling that truck? Have you lost your mind? Um, didn't actually, wasn't taking a poll here. You know, it's just like, but the, every, a lot of broke people have an opinion about money. Maybe it's time for everyone to stop taking a poll and do what's right for themselves and their family. George, that was like a Sorry. philosophy statement. I'm starting to hurt feelings like you. That was a, it's rubbing off on me. George, that was said way too nice to hurt anybody's feelings. You're right. Because it was posed as a passive aggressive question, so it wasn't even feeling That's hurt the millennial anybody. way. Maybe it's time. No, maybe it's not time. Maybe, maybe it's past time. Yeah, quit taking a poll on your life. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, don't, don't worry about boy, the way it looks on Facebook. Worry about the way it looks in real life. Ooh, dang. Yeah. That hurt, Dave. The seven people left on Facebook. My favorite just got one of all hurt. times is Rachel's whole thing on, like, no one gets a 1994 used Honda Accord and posts it on Facebook and goes, hey, hashtag blessed. You know. <laughs> that felt like a personal that's, attack that's like, on me, that's, Dave. That's perfect. I you love know it. me and my Honda Civic, my 09 Civic with body damage that you love so much. Hi, George. I'm going to post a picture today on Instagram. George, say, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be just blessed. what we were talking about. I'm going to be the guy giving you pressure to get a better car. I'm not taking a poll, Dave. The, the difference is that you, you actually have the money, you cheapskate. You just told me that we're not taking a poll, so <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm keeping my car. That doesn't mean I, I, I'll be just like those other people. I'm going to talk as if you're listening. <laughs> Unless you're buying me a new car, Dave. Then we'll talk. Well, indirectly. <laughs> That's, that is true. The man has a point. This well, is The so. Ramsey Show. If you're not using Pure Talk for your wireless, you're paying too much. Pure Talk gives you the same great 5G coverage on the same 5G network as one of the big guys for half the cost. The average family saves over $800 a year. Go to puretalk.com and choose the affordable plan that's right for you. With their 30-day risk-free guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Four, three. So a couple days ago, George and I took a call from an over-the-road truck driver who's, uh, he had been talking with his wife about trading cars 
and uh, without talking to him, she went and traded cars and went further into debt. He was pretty irate about that because um, they didn't were not in agreement about that, and she just went and did whatever she wanted to do. And uh, we talked to him for a few minutes. As the more we talked to him, the more if you go back and listen to the call. Uh, the more we were questioning what's really going on because he's like, he set her up, threw her under the bus pretty much. And then we're like, yeah, I think you probably, you're over the road. You, she's pregnant. She's do, got a baby due in nine days. And you probably, there's something else going on here. You, you read between you, the lines. I actually said you may need to come off the road and take care of your family and you guys need to get in marriage counseling. So um, she apparently was listening uh, or went back and listened to the call uh, and disagreed with a whole bunch of her uh, the things her husband said about her uh, and the conclusions we came to about her as a result uh, and so forth. So sent us a long email. Uh, and, and so we thought it'd be fun to kind of go back through that because it's really interesting. So here's the deal. Um, well, let's just say, okay, I listened yesterday, got to hear the call you took from my husband regarding the purchase of a van, resulted of financing 10K. I know responding probably won't get airtime to resolve the plethora of issues you two seem to pick up on, but I felt at least I could provide some context for my actions that would hopefully lead to a rebranding of my sanity, because I said she may have lost her dad gum mind, and accountability for the situation. The truth is partially, as you put it, I was backed into a corner and I bit back. So it sounded like they couldn't come into agreement and he's on the road, left her you know, stranded with a bunch of kids, and she just did whatever she wanted to do kind of thing. That was my point. And so... Um, then she goes on for about a page and a half explaining why it's okay to borrow money to buy a van and all this stuff, which, of course, is not true. Uh, my husband didn't mention that he's packed all of his things and moved out. That's true. He did not mention that and has taken half of our emergency fund with him uh, five, nine days before I deliver our second child. Oh, really? That's just nice. No, he didn't mention that because I probably would have ripped him a new one for doing that. It's like if you're going to leave, you don't leave nine days before a baby comes. Doob. Uh, you know, it, this didn't just suddenly happen. So, yeah, we would have, um, George and I would have teed off on him on that. Me more than George, but George, because George is generally not nicer. Too nice. Uh, she closes with, I'm not stupid. I've not lost my mind, but backed into a corner with no other resources or choices. I think I can own this one. And that's after rationalizing again for five paragraphs that buying the van was a good idea. So let's go back and recoup, re regroup on this whole thing for a little bit. Um, number one, I don't like it. When any of you, none of us at Ramsey like it, when you take our good common sense advice that is meant for you to prosper in your family and you weaponize it to use it on your family or weaponize it to use it on your spouse. There's a thing in here where he says, she says, he, he refused any car I looked at because he and, and he said, Dave always says, if the answer is no, we don't do anything. If the answer, if we can't come into agreement, the answer is no. Well, that's a general principle, yes. But what's going on here is you two are a hot mess. That's what's really going on here. Both of you, Jessica, you with your rationalization, which I completely understand how you get there in the middle of him being a control freak and you getting ready to have a baby, and I get all of that. But you rationalized your butt off, girl. I mean, it's ridiculous. And and him with his lying to us and weaponizing advice that we give here and using it to verbally thrash his wife with, um, you, you guys desperately needed marriage counseling a long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, long before he calls on this radio show. And uh, we certainly did not tell him to pack up his stuff and move out. And it sounds like he did and that. If you go back and listen to the call, nowhere did we even intimate that he should do that. We did tell him, you guys need marriage counseling, and baby doll, you did need marriage counseling. You do need marriage counseling. It's, a, it, you guys are a hot mess. You 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 bow up and just go do whatever the crap you want to do and go deeply in debt and buy a van that you shouldn't have. Uh, against his wishes, which indicates that you guys are not on the same page and have serious marriage problems, and he's being a twerp and a control freak and not coming up with some way to take care of his pregnant wife and kids and get her into a car that works. Well, to that end, uh, everybody this... wants what they want instead of being instead of serving each other in this marriage. She says, to quote him, I don't care if it has a welded five-gallon bucket for the front seat. You'll drive what I pick, or I won't agree to it. Because Dave says if you can't agree, you go with who says no. So See, I buy that it. is that's not, insane. that has never come out of here. I mean, we don't, that's just, that's just completely weaponizing the advice here. So, yeah, Jessica, you have a mess. Your husband is a mess. You're in a mess. 
and you did a stupid thing in the middle of all that. And, and it hurt and, to have her laundry aired out, you know, yeah, on national sure. radio. Well, too. I don't blame her for that sure. too. And I pick on ladies getting ready to have a baby in nine days. Oh my gosh! So, uh, but the, the point is, guys, this is if you can't get together on what to do with money, it's not a money problem. If you can't get together on what to do with your car, it's not a car problem. That's a marriage problem, and it's usually a selfishness problem. I mean, she was selfish because she just went and did whatever she wanted to do. He was selfish because he's like, I'm not going to agree to anything because I don't like it, and, I, and I'm on the road, and I'm going to hold all the power like he has any power, which apparently he didn't. So, uh, you know, it was just out of control. So the, the inverse of this is, hey, I love my wife, and I understand she's freaking out. i got to figure out some way to get her in a different car. That is good for our future, and going further in debt is not good for our future. Instead of, I'm going to tell you what to do, and Dave Ramsey, and oh my God, you twerp. And they, they mentioned, we didn't ask their income, they make $137,000. Yeah, and it paid off a bunch of debt, right? Yeah. How much was it? It was a lot. Uh, $50,000 in 15 months they paid off, she says. So, um, uh, what you, but you didn't ask what we made, she said. Well, I didn't ask what you made because that wasn't the question. The question wasn't, a, it's not a, an income wasn't a math problem. It was my wife bought a car that we didn't agree to problem. That was the call. It wasn't like how much money you make. How much money you make doesn't solve, you know, you two not getting along. So you could make 237000 and still not, you still shouldn't go do that. And he still shouldn't put you in a position that you felt like that was the only thing you could do. So you two are being, you're a hot mess. You're a hot mess, and you need to be in marriage counseling, both of you. Bad. And, and so, because here's the thing. Sharon Ramsey goes and does that, I'm going to have a problem. But I'm also not going to put her in a position that she feels like that's her only way. Mm -hmm. And if she feels like that's her only way, then she's got a serious Cinderella syndrome, like she deserves it entitled and I'm arrogant and whatever. Then we got another issue going on. And we're going to be sitting down with, with a professional and helping us guide through our relationship because apparently we can't guide through it ourselves. And we've done that. Ten years, you know, after we were married about 10 years, we about killed each other that year. And so, we, you know, marriage counselor saved our lives and our marriage. Saved my life because she probably would have killed me in my sleep. But, um, <laughs> but, the, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, and, and so I, can, I distinctly remember driving the crappy – You remember, this is how bad it was. You, you probably have seen these on the road. They're still out there. The two-tone blue Astro vans. Oh, yeah. You remember those? Yeah, those were real ugly. This is like the minivan of minivans. And it had like a bazillion miles on it. And I fried the transmission out of it, pulling the boat, because it wasn't designed to pull a boat. It was a lightweight little thing. And I uh, put a new transmission in it. And this thing, I mean, it stunk. It had Cheerios like neck deep in it. All over. it was, We'd raised little babies in it and dogs. And it was a mess. And she was over this van. And rightly so. It was a piece of crap. And we were starting to make a little money. We finally got a little bit of money. And she's like, I want to get a Suburban. I want to get an SUV. I'm like, that's $20,000. Might as well be. that gum $200,000. What do you mean? Well, you got $20,000 coming in down there at your company, our company. You keep telling me it's mine. I want some of the money out of there. Buy an SUV. And I'm like, yeah, but that $20,000 we can use to invest in this thing we're working on, and it's going to make us 100000 If we buy this car for 20000 and we went back and forth, and I went, Ugh. And we just we kept arguing about it. Finally, I had this moment where I went, you know what? It's not an either or. It's a win. And I said, so, okay, we're gonna, we need to do the investment at the company, and we need to buy the car. And which one, which one we What's do first? Is, which one we do first is the only thing that mattered. And so we just put her first. She won. There you go. And you know what? When she won, I won. Boom. Isn't that interesting? Woo! Here's the takeaway from this story, Dave. They've got a child on the way, and right now they're both being children. We need less children in this family. Ooh. How's that? Now you'll get another email, George. Uh oh. Yeah. We changed her brand. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Ramsey Show. is full of firsts. As the first 
and longest serving Christian health cost sharing ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts. Four, three. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. It is tax season. I don't know anyone who loves that, unless you're an accountant. Even the IRS doesn't love it. The truth is most of us dread filing taxes. It's a pain. It's confusing. And if it wasn't bad enough, the tax software most of you use hits you with extra hidden fees, and they try to sell you a bunch of debt while you're signing up just trying to get your taxes done. Filing your taxes does not have to be horrible. It does not. We created Ramsey Smart Tax to give you software that you can actually trust. Smart Tax has steps that are simple and clear so you know you've done your taxes right. No more headaches. No second guessing yourself. We'll never tack on surprises and we won't sell your info to scummy companies and we won't try to sell you a bunch of debt while you're doing your taxes. And when you sign up for Ramsey Plus, it's even easier. You can actually file your federal taxes for free if you're a Ramsey Plus member. So, don't get taken advantage of by your old tax software ever again. Time to make the change. Start your free trial of Ramsey Plus, and you can file your taxes free at RamseySolutions.com slash Ramsey Plus. Ramsey Plus is where you get Financial Peace University and every dollar and all that. And now, if you're a member of that, you also get Ramsey Smart Tax free. So go do your free trial. Get it all done. This is all free, 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 free. It's crazy. RamseySolutions.com slash Ramsey Plus. Kathy's in Buff- Buffalo, New York. Hi, Kathy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. What's up? Hi. Um, I'm a senior in college, and unfortunately, I mean, I worked pretty hard throughout college to like, save up money for a car and just like, an apartment after graduation and just for food and living expenses. Um, and I had around like 25 thousand dollars saved up for my car and just like after graduation but unfortunately covid kind of hit my family hard and my uncle had to borrow money to pay for my grandpa's hospital bill i'm like my grandpa and my dad um and now like they're not really giving my money back if that makes sense and i don't really know what to do about it how old are you um 21 Mm. how old's your uncle um, I mean, I, I don't know, but probably 40, yeah. 45. So this 45-year-old comes to the 21-year-old college kid and says, I can't pay my dad's hospital bill. You need to help. And you gave him your yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah, your family's a bunch of irresponsible people, aren't they? Um. Yeah, they're I mean, broke, and they can't yeah. take care of their grandpa, and they come to a kid to take care of them. That's the definition of irresponsible. I'll help you with that. I was shouldn't have been a question. Should have been a statement. Okay. How um, much money did you give him? Um, I mean, because like you know, hospital bills are like extraordinarily expensive, like fifteen thousand. Good lord. So you give him fifteen thousand dollars, and what was the the terms what, of this? What was the plan for him to repay you? Um, like I said, within like the next year. Yeah, and he said okay. Yeah. Where was he going to get the money? Um, the thing was, like, my aunt was out of work um, just because, like, she lost her job. And then she was going to pay me back, like, once she got a job. Where's your parents? Um, my parents, like, my parents, like, my dad's kind of arguing with my brother. I mean, with his brother. But, like, they kind of, the two of them are, like, having their own fight about money issues as well. That's shocking. Yeah, oh, kiddo, I'm yeah. so sorry. You are in a mess. I, I just want to box your uncle's ears. And I wish you had yeah. I wish you had stood up and just said no. Don't you? 
Yeah, I just didn't want like you know my grandpa to. They're not going to repossess your grandpa. It's just a hospital bill. They'll like, sue somebody for not paying a hospital bill, but they're they're not going to repossess him. Yeah, you Sorry, got you I got snookered by your family. Yeah, your next time your family knocks on the door, you need to just not open the door. Oh my gosh! How long ago was this, Kathy? Um, this happened like maybe a year and a half ago. I guess like yeah, like a year and a half ago, at the beginning of twenty twenty. Do you have anything in writing from your uncle? Um. Yeah, I have like an email. Hmm. Okay. Well, um. It doesn't sound like your father is going to be any help because he's not uh, got influence with your uncle right now because they're already fighting. Am I correct? Yeah, because like again. So if you call your uncle and say, "I look, uh, I, this is a mess," and I've, I, you're going to, this is going to cost me going to college. You've got to get this money together. Go to the bank and get it, and send me my money. I've got to have this money. What's he going to say? I mean, I tried doing that, and then like. um because, like, the thing is, like, I tried doing that, and he was just like, you can go into debt. I'll pay you back, I promise. And, like, because of that. Because, like, that was also supposed to be, like, partial. Because, like, I pay, like, ten grand a year for school because of, like, financial aid. And then, like, food and rent on top of that. And then it's just kind of, like, I kind of had to put my tuition, though, um, because of that. What a butthole. I'm, like, going to debt. This guy's a class A. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I, 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 I don't know how to make a person that doesn't have character suddenly have character, and your your uncle is a scumburger. And you realize that now. Yeah, I, like, I knew that. But, I mean, I didn't know going into the situation because he wasn't, you know what I mean? I never, like, my yeah. parents never really yeah. dealt with well, him financially. The, sad, the bad news is at 21 years old, you've had this very harsh lesson. The great news is you will never have to have this lesson again because you will never do something like this again because this has hurt so badly and put you in such a bad position. And so, the you know, I, I hope you haven't lost the money permanently, but you probably have because your uncle is scum. Yeah. Anybody that would come to a 21-year-old and ask for their college money in order to take care of their grandfather because you didn't go figure out some other way to do it is scum by definition by definition because if the worst case scenario is grandpa let me tell you if he'd call me i just said grandpa can't pay his bill call the hospital tell him he can't pay the bill he didn't have any money i'd rather owe the hospital money than i would little kathy that it's just a matter of who we're gonna owe right so this is just yeah. this is just garbage it's just garbage Oh my gosh, Kathy. So here's the thing. I, you, you have really two courses of action and none of them are good. I wish I could give you a good answer. Course of action. Number one is call him back and say, um, I sure hope you can pay me. I sure hope you do what you said you were going to do. I hope you're a man of honor and a man of your word because you're leaving me in a lurch and hang up the phone and then have low expectations because he's scum that you ever get this money and you're probably not going to get it. Okay. Uh, course of action. Number two is hire a lawyer and sue his butt. Yeah. I'm kind of too broke for that. I mean, no, I, you're not. I won't be no, you're not. Lawyer, lawyer will take this. They'll take it. Cause this looks like fun. <laughs> I'm telling you they'll they'll take it for a percentage. And when he collects it out of your uncle's hide, he'll, um, uh, you know, but here's the thing. You'll be done with him forever. But by the way, if he's my uncle, I'm done with him forever anyway. He's not going to speak to you yeah. again once you sue him. But I really don't care because he ain't worth speaking to. This guy's a dirtbag. I agree. Kathy, he treated you like a doormat because you're a really nice, sweet person. And he thought he could get the money. He took and advantage he of a 21-year-old young lady in college. This is making me mad as your adopted uncle. I'm your other <laughs> uncle, the one that's going to kill this one. <laughs> yeah, it's like really bad because it's like all of my like all of my other uncles are like hating this one uncle, and like my mom and dad's also like really pissed off. It's like it's yeah, you got a mess on your dysfunction all over the place. It's not fair that you have to deal with this. 
So you have two choices. Just lower your expectations and don't expect to get the money, or go whole hog and start throwing grenades with them to turn. That's your two choices. Make your decision and then rest in peace with whichever decision you rest in. Either one's fine with me and either one will be great. I'm so sorry. Four, three. This is the Ramsey Show. George Campbell, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. George, one of the things we've discovered in uh, studying family businesses is that the uh, family business is never any more or less toxic than the family. It's never any more less functional or more functional than the family is. A dysfunctional family cannot have a functional family business. The other thing that kind of goes with that, the parallel track for that is there, there's a, a lot of data in our data here over 30 years of doing this and, and even in the millionaire research that indicates that to the extent that your immediate family, husband and wife, and your extended family, uncles, aunts, parents, so on, to the extent that people observe correct and reasonable moral boundaries with each other to the extent that the marriage is functional, to the extent that the interaction with the grown kids and grandkids is functional, meaning that there's not a bunch of uh, manipulation, lying, drug use, uh, cheating, whatever, running around on it, whatever, all this stuff, to the extent they're functional, there's a high correlation with that and the ability to build wealth. There's a high correlation you can't build wealth in the middle of if your if your family just puts the fun in dysfunction, I mean it's just very difficult to do it, and it's kind of been the theme this hour. Yeah, a lot of dysfunction on all these calls, and what it comes down to is you can't give family money. It just never ends up working out for you. I'd rather you be mad at a lender and Sally May and Sally May sue you than a family member sue you because that relationship is done. It's but, hard to recover. But you, when you have a money problem of any kind in the family. But husband and wife buying a van, you have a money problem in the family. Uncle wants money to pay grandpa's medical bills. When you have a money problem in the family, it is never the problem. It is always the symptom of something else going on. Yeah. And so the very fact that this family system in that last call is set up in a way that a 40-something-year-old man can call a 21-year-old niece who's in college and basically steal her college fund, and in his mind, somehow that's all right. Or it didn't happen this hour, but we've gotten the call before, uh, you know, these, these parents who take their minor children's identity and go open a bunch of credit cards in them, and then when the minor children gets married as an adult and is 25, 26 years old, discovers that there's a whole bunch of credit card debt that their mom put in their name when they were 14. I mean, that's just, that's that's criminal fraud. Go to jail, do not pass go, but people do it. And, and there's this this thing that happens in some of our families out there that, that people make this statement. Well, you have to take care of family. As if that statement makes all of your miscellaneous ridiculousness go away. Like, well, I, I just can't. I have to take care of mama. I have to. I mean, you have to. You have to take care of family. You just have to take care of family. Whatever it is. I mean, I mean, yeah, I understand. He stole three cars. He does cocaine. He shot his neighbor. But you have to take care of family, you know? 
But, you know, I mean, people are just ridiculous. Yeah, at what point does it just become enabling misbehavior? Yeah, I think. Mom didn't save up any money her whole life, and now it's our job to take care of her for the next 20 years. And that's not mean, okay? it's If you want to take care of mom and you're able to take care of mom, that's okay. But this idea that you take this child's college fund, I just want to... Send out the Ramsey SWAT team for this guy, man. Which doesn't exist, by the way, America, in case you're wondering. Oh, we could we could form it pretty quick around here, though. That's true. Uh, but that that's just makes you furious to hear stories like that. So here's the thing, guys. My point of this rant is that if you do not recognize where crazy is in your family, and every family has crazy in it, and if you think yours doesn't, it's you. So... Um, if you haven't, if you don't recognize where crazy is in your family and learn to put proper boundaries in place early in your life and you don't teach, you know, let's say you got a functional family, mom and dad are teaching a 14 year old who later becomes a 21 year old. Okay. Uncle so-and-so's bad news. Okay. He comes around, you just Stay run away. him off. Run Stranger off, danger. Okay. Danger, danger. That's right. Stranger. Oh, <laughs> kindergarten copper. There we go. Good. Yeah. But I mean, you, you gotta, it's, yeah, you, you have to teach the danger of, of this and it, it's just oh man everyone needs to read uh, henry you, cloud until boundaries. you fix your marriage you're not going to build wealth until you set boundaries with your crazy uncle and your your deadbeat drug son you're not going to build wealth until you deal with the dysfunction in your family you're not going to build wealth you can't get rich enough to not screw it up with these people intersecting your life and you just allowing them free reign because i just got to take care of family you know that kind of cra- it's just ah do people think that they're they're being selfish if they don't help? Is that what it oh, comes it's, down it's, to? It's, it's enabling from now on. And and these people, the people on the other side of it, are they're travel agents for guilt trips. Oh, that's good. I mean, this guy, he just, well, Grandpa, you got to take care of your grandpa, you poor old grandpa. Don't you want to take care of your grandpa? You selfish little college student, aren't you? Well, it made me we'll think. smack you. Unbelievable. How did we know he even used that on medical bills? Now I'm second guessing this guy's integrity, going, who knows what that money went towards? I'll, there's a car in the driveway, probably. No, it's a pickup. Oh always a God. pickup, isn't it? It's always a bass boat. Uh, wouldn't be a ski boat, it'd be a bass boat. Yeah. <laughs> You've got the ski boat, that's why you're saying that. Ski boat folk are different. <laughs> no, they're not. They're just as bad. Oh my oh. gosh. I'm telling this is just, but here's the thing you can't outrun this. You have to deal with the family stuff or you're not going to get ahead financially. You're always going to be brought down by the dysfunction until you've dealt with the dysfunction or put a boundary to the dysfunction and a fence around you to where you can work around it. You're not you, you cannot make enough money to out earn this. You have to deal with it. So there's a high correlation between the ability to build wealth and good boundaries and functional families. My grandmother used to say when she was alive, she's in a small town, she would say, so-and-so comes from a good family. Now, certain members of our family would accuse her of being uppity, like she thought they meant, that meant that they were country club folk or something instead of the other kind of folk, right? And that wasn't what she was referring to at all. When I got to know her as an adult later, what she meant was, they were a good family. They had integrity. That's what she meant. And you want to you want you want to be around a good family. And there are good families. There, none of them are perfect, but I mean there are some that do a better job at this stuff than others. But oh my gosh, it's almost impossible to uh, uh, you know. Some of you have to just become an adult. Some of you are listening in your you're 19 or you're 21. You just have to become an adult and set up your own life because your whole bunch over there is nuts. You know, and you just got to come over here to the side and just look over there and like, they're like, they're like something in a psychology book. Every one of them's got one of those things, you know, I mean, it's like unbelievable. And and so you, some of you just have to do that. And and some of you just have to deal with the one crazy mother-in-law, you know, and some of you have to deal with your marriage stuff and not be so dadgum selfish and power hungry and entitled and all those things, which Sharon and I have dealt with coming up on 40 years. And uh, now I've kind of got it down with Sharon, though. I have figured it out, George. What's the secret? I told her the other day, if she leaves, I'm going with her. (laughs) (laughs) How'd she take it? (laughs) She might put out a restraining order at that point. (laughs) Man. Don't give her ideas. Sorry. I have her, I She's have thought her, of it. I have her convinced, George. I'm, not, I'm no genius. I but, have her convinced. Well, here's what it comes down to. 
you've got to have boundaries and you can't change people. And so at some point, you've got to just draw the line and say, listen, uncle, he's just cut off. We just can't be friends with uncle. You yeah. can't be friends with grandma because yeah. it's toxic. And that's a hard thing to do to and cut off family. it's not about the money. It's about the fact that you stole from me. Yes. You know? It's not the money. The money doesn't matter. It's, it's that you mistreated a 21-year-old college student. You jerk. You unbelievable jerk. You, I hope he's listening. I hope he. I hope I get that email back. That'll be a fun one. Hey, Unc, if you're listening, jump on. I'd love to talk to you. That'll be fun. Not for you. This is the Ramsey Show. (laughs) Hey, it's John Deloney, co-host of the Ramsey Show. Did you know over 18 million people listen to the Ramsey Show every week? A lot of those people listen on one of our 600 plus radio stations across the country. To find a station near you, go to RamseySolutions.com slash show. Four, three. This is the Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225 as we talk about your boundaries, your relationships, your mental health, your career, your job, your money, and it's all on the line right here on the Ramsey Show. 888-825-5225. Mary's in Orlando. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hey, Dave. I'm doing well. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Good. So my husband and I are in baby step four, five, and six, and my child is going to college in the fall, God willing. Cool. Um, We have enough in savings to cover the cost of her tuition. Mm -hmm. Um, She's been offered some scholarships and things like that, but we have also made it very clear that she's going to have some skin in the game, and we've given her an amount that she has to pay each year. Um, It's minimal compared to the tuition, but it is significant for her. How much? Uh, 5000 a year. Okay. Now, the question is, um, something that my husband and I are debating are what to do with that 5000 if we keep it for ourselves because we're splitting the rest of it, <laughs> or do we put it in a different savings account to give to her at the end of her college career, pending she does well and everything finishes school and takes advantage of the opportunities that we've given her? You're divorced. No, no, no. Why are you splitting it? I'm sorry? You said we're splitting the rest of it. No, because we're, we're footing the rest of it. Oh, footing, footing it. it. I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, you could do either one. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. It's your money. It, there's not a not a wrong answer. Um, it'd be cool if you could save up the money and give it back to her after she graduates. That'd give her a head start. Uh, but if you need it to accomplish some goal you're hitting, there's nothing wrong with that. You've you've laid out the guidelines. Have you coached her and shown her some ways she can make five thousand dollars? Yes, she's on her way. She she's she's doing pretty well right now with her savings. It sounded like you were saying that she's a little worried about making that much money. It's significant for her because. She's saving decently, but once school starts, she can't keep working the way that she's been working. Could she work like 10 hours a week? She mainly works on holidays and summers. Okay. Well, she can make 5000 in the summer. I mean, she's just going to bust it. You know, nannying, dog sitting, waiting tables. I don't know. I mean, you can make five grand in the summer. So get at, get after it. Yeah. But, I mean, I want to coach her. I don't want to just go, oh, I hope. Good luck with that. You know, she's she maybe never done, done this before. She doesn't know how to earn money. So t- give her some entrepreneurial ideas. And, you know, when I was 12, I asked my dad for money. He handed me a lawnmower. You know, it's like <laughs> go, go knock on the neighbor's door. It's where money comes from. And so uh, you can do stuff like that. You can walk with her. But 
I, and I would recommend that. And it, it, here's going to be my guess. This sounds like the first time you guys have done this. I'm going to guess and say you put this money aside and you'll give it back to her. Uh, but you're not obligated to do that morally, ethically, financially, or anything. It's just if you want to, and uh, and if you're able to. But if you're on four, five, and six, you're working a plan. I think you'll be able. Yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, if if you're saying, hey, I can go to school debt free, and my skin in the game is five grand a year, that's an incredible, incredible deal for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. obviously, you don't need the money, and so maybe you go, hey, this money could help us pay down the house faster, which is going to set us up in an incredible way to be a baby step seven. And, uh, but either way, if you hand it to her when she graduates as a gift and go, hey, this is some money, you can go upgrade your car, maybe it's a down payment on a house one day, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Noble. Yeah. I, I have a feeling you're going to hit your financial goals and be able to do that. But it's not necessary. It's not, it's not mandatory. You're not a bad person it's if just, you don't. Yeah, you, you didn't do something wrong if you didn't do that. It's not even a moral obligation to pay for your child's education. You're not a bad parent if you don't pay for it at all. It's not, you know, it's not, there's no law. There's no standard. You're a bad it's parent just, if you don't have the conversation at all or don't talk to your kid honestly about where things are at. That's where I go, this needs to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Just turning them loose in the wild and they don't know how, they don't know what wolves look like called student loan people. Um, yeah, that, that's dangerous. I agree with that. But I'm just saying that the, 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 like I've talked to a single mom and she's barely making ends meet just feeding the kids is a big deal yeah. and she's feeling all guilty because she's not gonna be able to pay for college i'm like you're not a bad mom you fed them they had a roof over their head you did a good job i mean you're a warrior lady and christina ellis our ramsey personality here she has an amazing story of her mom single mom going hey i can't pay a dime yeah. for college figure it out yeah. and i want to help you but you got to figure this out and she I coached her pay. and went with her to the library and she got a half a million dollars in scholarships it's amazing so, yeah you know that's exactly right Taylor is with us in Sacramento. Hey, Taylor, what's up? Hi, yeah. So I'm on Baby Step 3B and Baby Step 4 right now. I'm currently renting and planning on buying my first home, like, within two or three years when kind of the market slows down here in California. Uh, But I know you guys don't recommend to purchase a manufactured home, but but is there any significant difference, especially for a first-time home buyer, to buy a brand new home that nobody's ever lived in to an older home or any other home type? Is there any kind of financial difference or something that I should consider when buying a house for the first time? Now, you're talking about a traditionally built new home versus a used home. Yes. Manufacturing homes not in this discussion. No, I know okay. you don't recommend I buying don't. manufactured, you, but right. any other home type, even yeah. condos. Typically, or what you'll find is is that the new home prices will be at the top of the market in a normal real oh. estate market. We are not in a normal anything right now, okay? <laughs> but in a normal world, and like I got my real estate license in 1978, so since 1978 mm-hmm. until 24 months ago. And I don't, I don't have any idea what, what's out there. You know, I, I, there's no way to know today what you will run into in this weird thing we're in right now. Mm-hmm. But in a normal world, new construction will be a higher per square foot price than a used housing in the okay. same neighborhood across the street. You know, that kind of a thing. Now, you know, location will change pricing on real estate always. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, you can't, you, you, five miles away may be a big difference. You may cross two lines there that people go, oh, you're on the other side of the tracks now, you know, or whatever. So that's a different thing. But uh, not counting location, if you're in the same general vicinity, very close vicinity, in a normal real estate market, you're going to find new housing to be uh, at a, at a, uh, the big, what we call retail, full retail price. And okay. it'll be the leading edge, more expensive. It doesn't mean it's not a good buy. It doesn't mean it won't go up in value. It doesn't mean it's not a good idea because sometimes you're in a growth area of the, uh, of the Metroplex versus a, a bad area or an, an area that's kind of slowing down or something or yeah. that kind of stuff. So, you, you know, you, you got a lot of, a lot of factors going in, but if they're two houses on each side of the street, then yeah. Yeah, and Taylor, I got a new construction home, and it is almost 2 x because we live in one of the most expensive counties, the great school system, great neighborhood, and so it really does depend largely it was on two. It wasn't 2 x of a used house. No, it was no. brand new. As you say, it's gone up 2 x It's gone up 2 x yeah. in, yeah. in a little over two years. So you're, you're just fine, but I mean, at that time, you could have bought a used house slightly cheaper. Yeah. But the same square footage. But you got a nice place, got it paid off, yep. and it's gone up double. Yeah. I'll take it. This is The Ramsey Show.
Look, I love real estate and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey to start your approval or get more information. Five, four, three. Well, tax season is upon us. Try to contain your excitement. <laughs> no one likes doing taxes, especially when you realize what the big software companies are up to. Every year, these companies lure you in saying, you can file your taxes for free. And then when you're knee deep in the filing, they sucker punch you with upcharges, loan offers, credit card pitches. There's a better way to do this. It's called Ramsey Smart Tax. This is our online tax filing software with Ramsey Smart Tax. You get all the deductions, all the forms, every tax break you deserve. The best part is the price. Ours is already much lower than the leading competitor, and you won't have hidden fees, and you won't get sold debt in the process. You get a promo code right now. You can make it completely free to file your taxes. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. Get the promo code. File without surprises. RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. Our question of the day comes from blinds.com. Find out for yourself why they are the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. This is a wonderful company. If you're doing window blinds, you get free samples, free shipping, new promos all the time. You save even more. Always use the magic word, the promo code Ramsey to get the best deal. Today's question comes from Kyle in New York. He said, my wife and I make around 165000 a year combined. I've been in my job for about four years, and I've never gotten a raise or a promotion. The company has not given anyone a raise or promotion since I've been there that I'm aware of. It's a tech consulting company, but we work with very outdated technology. I've tried for over a year now to get a new job, but my skill set is not aligned with all of the newer technologies required by the industry. If I don't get out now, I'll be stuck in this position forever. But I need about four to six months of studying and upskilling. At this moment, having a full-time job is making this impossible. I have about 40000 in emergency funds, and I live in a very high cost of living area. Should I quit my job and focus on updating my skills and my resume? I don't think there's just an either-or option here that he's backed himself into. I I personally would not quit. You may have a different opinion here, Dave, but I feel like both are possible, even if it's a part-time job in the tech consulting world. Okay, dude. Um, you need to let your boss know that you're working 40 hours, not 80. And then you need to throw a brick through your TV. You have time to do the upskilling. I mean, just if you're working 40-hour a week, you, you can get your other skills. You can start doing code school at night. You can do code schools on the weekends. You write a check and get to get your certs. Um, but you don't ride this horse until it dies. It's dying. This horse, is, he, he's stumbling along. He's about to die. You're in, you're in a tech field that is dying. If they're not upgrading, not changing, not moving, y you don't have the option of working there for the rest of your life because this company is going to fail because they're, they're, they're servicing only a technology that is going away. Apparently. That's what it sounds like. And so you don't have a choice. You have to do this. But you're, you, you, you've added a little drama to this. Uh, so turn off your television. Give up vacations. No whining. Go back to school at night on the weekends. Get down to 40 hours and do that. You can do this. You can do this. 
I'm calling BS on the I have to quit to go to school. Yeah. I don't believe it. I mean, yeah. I, I, well, uh, we got tech guys around here that are always upscaling. And they're always doing all kinds of and stuff. They do and sometimes, it we do it on the, sometimes they do it on the clock here. Sometimes they've done it while they worked at other places to get ready to come to work here because we use cutting, bleeding edge stuff here. But, um, oh, man. Yeah. I mean, it may be some long evenings and long weekends if for If I don't a few get months, out now, but... I'll be stuck in this position forever. No, you won't because they're going to fail. You're not going to be stuck. You're going to be on the street. Um, you know, having a full-time job makes this impossible. Now, your your language is just hyperbole. Dramatic. Yeah, it's a lot of drama here. So impossible. Stuck forever. You know, and now none of these things are true. So you're going to be okay. But, dude, you're, you are going to have to sacrifice, like, all your free time. So going out to eat with your little friends and stuff, no, you're not going to get to do that for a while because you are, you're getting reskilled and upskilled and moving. That's, you know. The people we meet on this debt-free stage, they find time to get those side jobs and to find those side hustles, and it's worth it. And to, to get the well, to go to class and get the certs, you know, whatever it is you got to do. But it's it's there. You can do this. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Miles, what's up? Hey, Dave. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the airwaves with you guys today. You too. How can we help? Uh, about uh, three weeks ago, my car got stolen out here. Um and uh, I had comprehensive coverage on it, so uh, they're offering about a thousand less than it's worth. And then their evaluation was only twenty dollars for aftermarket parts. Um, the car had like roof rack, tinted windows, like nice rims and wheels, uh, Bluetooth stereo, upgraded speakers. So I was wondering if you have any tips or guidance for trying to increase that settlement. Uh, you're going to have to provide actual facts like receipts and uh, appraisals, okay? So let's just start with the price of the car. The car is worth this, and you can look that up on kellybluebook.com, and you can provide them cars from trader.com that are just like yours that sold for this. And then here are the receipts, or here's a price online price list to buy the rims that I had, the roof rack that I had, the stereo that I had. But they're not going to go, I don't think you're being fair. That doesn't work. You have to give them actual facts. So what you're doing here is you're building a court case. You're building a case that says you are trying to sell, trying to give me less than the policy calls for, which is replacing this vehicle. This vehicle, because of the roof rack, the rims, and the current market value based on this piece of data, this piece of data, this piece of data, this piece of data is worth X number of dollars, and you need to give me that or more. And they will. Okay, that makes sense. Do you um, have photos of all the work that was done? Um, I, I uh, bought it off Facebook off a of guy, so I have a picture of the ad. But I don't know specifically, like, what, uh, you know, the model of the stereo was, any of that. Oh, so you don't I have guess, the receipts uh, personally because you didn't do the work. Right. Mm. Okay. That's fine. Just, yeah. But go ahead and start, you know, say this is the stereo that was in it, and here's what it sells for over at XYZ Stereo Company, okay? Here's the rims. This tire company sells the rims for this. And, you know, and here's the roof rack, and here's where here's what it costs to buy that. Those are all upgrades. And this is the base car. Here's four cars like it. And here's Kelly Blue Book's numbers. And they all say that you're a 1000 bucks low. Who's the company? Okay. Uh, Progressive. Okay. They'll pay you. They're not bad. You just, But you do have to work in facts. As if you're making the case, like pretend like you're going into a, a court of law and you have to prove what the car is worth, not just you had a feeling. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I got to start uh, researching, like based off the pictures, what I think the rims are and all, all stuff like that. So yeah, so just do a little bit of ba backup work, and then send you know start flooding them with emails. Here's the thing too, if you send them like e like six emails or seven emails with all kinds of different information, and then you send them one summary email that gives them a total. Uh, the guy starts to realize you're not going away. You're not going to be easy to work with. As a matter of fact, this guy might even get a, this Miles guy. He might get a lawyer, and the, the the claims adjuster wants this off his desk, and he's going, "Oh, this has put an effort into it." Uh, so he's just gonna he's just gonna go boom. Be okay. the squeaky wheel. I've done this in two different situations where I had cars totaled or I had them uh, uh, stolen, and uh, in both cases I went back to them, showed them, and it was one. Back and forth. It was not a big negotiation. In every case, I got everything I was supposed to get. Uh, the only time I didn't get the proper amount was I was dealing with State Farm, and they're notorious for not paying their claims. 
So um, horrible company. But the uh, uh, but everybody else, I mean, Farm Bureau. I remember I had a great transaction with them. A guy hit me, and we went. We showed them exactly what it was, and they went, "Oh yeah, that's right. Okay." And you know, they bumped it up, paid, wrote a check instantly. They were just, you know, most of the time these guys see paying a, a, a an auto claim as almost PR. Uh, they spend all this money on progressive on advertising. They don't want you out there running them down. Yeah, and they sense. do. They really, honestly, we work with progressive on different things around here all the time, and they they do a good job. You're I'd contact the seller too and see if he can provide receipts. Yeah, just get his contact good. info. Wouldn't, you've wouldn't got. Be, but if you just show them that you're making an effort on this, that 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 kind of says to them, uh, I got to deal with this guy, and they go, oh, it ain't worth it. And he just it's, marks it up yeah. and sends you a check, and that's that's the way it'll come down. This is the Ramsey Show. If you're considering a career in technology, I recommend Bethel Tech, and I'm not alone. Here's what Brendan said. Before Bethel Tech, I was driving Uber. Within four months of graduating, I got a job paying $60,000. About two years after that, I got a remote job that pays me $130,000, all thanks to what I learned at Bethel Tech. You could be next. Get started today at BethelTech.net and get $1,000 to $2,500 off of your tuition. Again, it's BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. Four, three. Welcome back to the Ramsey Show. George Camel, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host. So a few years ago, when Twitter was actually not just a cesspool, Jimmy Kimmel uh, would go on and read uh, Jimmy Reads Mean Tweets, and we stole it from him uh, and started doing you know tweets that are mean about us because they're fabulous. They're so fun, and a lot of them are like the high school students going through the curriculum and stuff, and uh, a lot of them are Being just forced against their will to and watch a lot, us. And a lot of them are just, you know, people can just they, you know, they have digital courage. These are things you, you would never say stuff like this to somebody's face because you get your face punched in. But um, <laughs> but you know, people people just say anything on the internet, and it's so cute. So we wanted to bring it back. Um, Dave reads mean tweets, and George looks at the comments. So, George, you're, you're, you're get, you get trashed on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Not as much on Twitter, but YouTube, they're big fans of leaving me some, some love. Okay, so you, you, you're going to read some of the things said about me, I guess. Yes. All right. Man, I've been waiting a long time for this, Dave. <laughs> Don't take it personal, okay? Uh, All right. I, I could take it out on you, but... Oh, you will soon, because you get to read my comments. Oh, there we go. Okay. Herman said... Impulse buying an Xbox feels great when you ain't got a Dave Ramsey in your ear. Good stuff from Herman there. Yeah. Herman's emotional intelligence, his, his emotional, what, 13 years old? He's got to be. Yeah. Okay. Money Mitch said, who named Dave Ramsey king of finance for every Christian church? Is king of finance like Burger King? I like that. Is that like the we Burger King? We should get you a little crown. Give me a little burger. Give me a little king of finance crown. I need a little crown. <laughs> Oh, here's one. Uh, Username Boycott Delta. That's interesting after our Delta rant earlier. He said, I've listened to a lot of Dave Ramsey. I'm convinced he quite literally doesn't know how credit cards work. He's become a victim of his own propaganda. Ooh. That's deep. That is deep. But it's all on the premise that I don't understand how a credit card works, which is... That's kind of humorous. Yeah, the, the two sentences don't make sense together, yeah. okay. but that's Twitter for you. All right, Carly said, if my mama doesn't stop pushing Dave Ramsey on me, I swear, with a little crying face. She's very upset. Yeah, she's 19. Well, I don't blame her. If her mom, back off, I quit using me as a weapon. Just why don't you push like common sense on her instead of Dave Ramsey? That's better. I, I think that I think she's probably right. We're just getting warmed up here. Haymaker said Dave Ramsey is a charlatan, hypocrite, and basic piece of beep. 
you can guess what word that was. Strong you know, words? here's a, you know, think about it. I, that comes up. Uh, charlatan shows up a lot after my name, which it's is a very so, fancy. That's a ten dollar word. I know. And here's the thing. I was thinking about this. Um, I read one of these the other day, and it popped into my head. How many times are you at a party and you use the word charlatan? Zero for me. I mean, how many times do you have in a sentence with normal human beings you use the word charlatan? Well, if they're talking but, about you, maybe at parties. I don't that know. That could be. It could be. It could be. It's a, an anti-Dave party, but um. But I mean, it's not—it's just not something. It comes up only on the internet. It's my point. Oh yeah, it only right. comes up when you're not a real a real person having a real conversation. You would use the word hypocrite or, yeah. p- or piece of bleep. You would do that. I personally but, wouldn't. But I'm you classy. wouldn't. But people would. Yeah. But they don't say charlatan. So and so's a charlatan. They don't drink. You know. Well, if if you're a keyboard warrior, you want to look smart. Why? No. Yeah. And you, and the thing is, it had to it had to spell check. Yeah. Because you couldn't spell it. No. Okay. They probably started with an S and got it wrong. Yeah. All right. Brian Moody said, Dave Ramsey is good for people to clean up a financial mess and get their house in order. He started out nice. But wealthy people don't baby step. Hmm. Okay. So the 45 millionaires we've talked to on the air this year, we started tracking millionaires we talked to on the air. So since January 1 on this show, we've talked to 45 millionaires. I guess they would beg to differ. He has a different definition of, of millionaires, maybe. Or wealthy. Yeah. yeah. Wealthy people. There we go. Kyle Henkel said, I think Dave Ramsey financial advice is cringy. Cringy. There's a lot of misspellings there, but. You know what? They're, yeah, they're, yeah, it it's really fun. is. It's but, fun. Wait, but uh, you know what? I uh, uh, It is cringy. It's so cringe, Dave. Dead free. No, it Ew. is. It's cringy because it, it, like, it says, ooh, you have to sacrifice to win. That is cringy. That's so cringe. No, it is. I mean, so, it's like that's kind of like ugh. I kind of, I kind of agree with him. Get with the times, Dave. People don't want to hear that. <laughs> All right, Addy said, proud owner of a new Tacoma. If Dave Ramsey found out, he'd probably 360 no scope me. I had to look this one up, Dave. This is a Call of Duty reference in which a player spins around with the rifle and shoots with no scope, killing their target. Uh, let me ha- let me help you with this. He didn't really, because it's not a real rifle. It's on a Video game. Call so of Duty is a video game. They're assuming game. that you are playing Call of Duty. And well, yeah. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fake kill him on a fake game. Is that? That's is how the that, metaverse that, works. That's what happens if you buy a Tacoma. I fake kill you on a fake game. <laughs> you just described the metaverse, Dave. Okay. You finally got it. I finally got it. Okay. Just, I couldn't. Uh, Jen said, in my head, I mixed up Dave Ramsey and Gordon Ramsey and really thought all this time <laughs> that Gordon Ramsey was giving financial advice in addition the, to being a chef. Have you seen the clip of Gordon Ramsey? Somebody said, who's Dave Ramsey? He's like, bleep, 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 Dave Ramsey, bleep, 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 bleep. Yes. It's hilarious. Oh, they're, they're, it's at so the, funny. they're at the grocery store and Gordon Ramsey's helping them shop. And, and the guy accidentally says Dave Ramsey and Instead of Gordon Ramsay. And he goes, I'm not bleeping Dave Ramsey. It was a great clip. <laughs> That's so funny. He's, he's a great. All right, last one for you. Also, Cool Kid with uh, a K and a K said, Dave Ramsey is a cokehead. And then parentheses, this is libel. Spelled li- wrong. Actually, he spelled it wrong. It's libel. That's how libel. he spelled it, but it's libel. Yeah. Wow. Well, clear the air, Dave. Are you a cokehead? And is that libel? I, I hadn't had a coke in a long time. I quit <laughs> drinking coke. There, he did. I got not, a big he didn't head. Two two I got together. a big head. Does that count? I got a big basketball head. That counts. That does that count? I feel like if you if you were a coke head, we'd have a very different show on our hands. Well, yeah, because the caffeine in Coca Cola will that's it'll right. light you up. That's man. so I'm true. Saying, so. All right, Dave, my turn. I get a few here. So boomer. I don't have as many. All right, David says uh, George gives worthless advice. The absolute worst of all Ramsey personalities. Yikes. George. What's scary is I'm just giving the advice you would have given. <laughs> so what does that say about you? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, since they all kind of say the same thing, but with different tones. That's hurtful. Yeah. That's, yeah. All right. Fair. J- Janelle, and she says this like once a week. This is normal for George, Janelle. George, Janelle, this Janelle's like, a, she's like head of your anti-fan club. Hey, I'll take it. Any PR is good PR, they say. George has the charisma of a wet sock. Sorry, man. At least she apologized right after. Yeah, that's it's, nice it's passive aggressive, but yeah. But is a wet sock yeah. has does no, that no have disrespect, no disrespect. Right after they disrespect yeah. you, that's always that's always like throwing that on the end because it, it negates it. Yeah. Wouldn't a dry sock have less charisma? I feel like if something's dry, it has even less. I don't know, Janelle. I don't know how you measure sock charisma. No. I don't know what the measure on sock charisma All right. is. All right. Who is the nerd in glasses giving advice? Well, we both have glasses on. Is he new or something? 
Oh, uh, boy. No, I've actually lost weight. I look about this. You look great, Dave. And, and I don't so think do you're you. a nerd. I think you're so just who, intellectual. Does, does Deloney wear glasses? He doesn't wear glasses. No, I'm the, just me and you holding down it's the fort. Just fort. you and me. Yeah, because Rachel had glasses before she got like that the gla- the uh, eye thing done. Oh yeah, and her, it looked like Coke bottle bottoms. I mean, they, she looked like the kid, They're like, like the guy in Office Space. You remember that need the stapler? Oh yeah, that's what her glasses. We both like. have terrible uh, eyesight, yeah. me and Rachel. Whew, Here's the thing: it's people awful. say, "Is he new or something?" And I've been here nine years, guys. Get a clue. You Are act- you new? Whatever. George came off as a little rat bag at first, but he's grown on me. Thank he's you, consistent Dave. and he's logical. Oh, that's a comment. I thought you were just telling me that. <laughs> no, said James said this. James Smith, not, not James, James our in producer. The booth. James, not oh, James in the booth. James Smith said this, which is probably, I'm sure, his real name. So it started. So what, off is, dark. what is a rat bag? I don't know. It just sounds a good. Bag of rats. It's a bag of rats, I guess. Came off as a little rat. I guess a little condescending, know-it-all, little you know, punchable face type guy. Well, yeah, but I mean, he could have just said a little rat. I don't know what a bag of rats is i don't, I don't know but at least he he then went he's he's grown on me he's consistent he's logical so i'll take that he's a he's a logical consistent little rat bag but trying to end it on a positive note for you <laughs> thank you james <laughs> this is just james actually letting us know how he feels about us and he just changes the names out. james wrote all these <laughs> that's cool man <laughs> kelly wrote some of them i know she did here's my worry dave people are now going to write in specifically Hope, trying to get on the to show get, hoping to get other uh, their mean tweet on the show so we're never doing this again no. because we're thin-skinned and That's our right. feelings are hurt. And I'm going to have to go home and cry because you, three of you don't like me on the Internet. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. Four, three. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. I don't know why anyone would want our advice after that last segment, but we're going to give it to you anyway. Lauren is with us in Oklahoma City. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi there. How's it going? Better than I deserve. What's up? <laughs> Just a quick question on what your ideas, opinions, input is on uh, following a passion job versus financial security, stability, uh, essentially chasing the money. I'm 42 years old. I have a double income with my wife. We have two kids, uh, very little debt, about 50,000 total debt, including a vehicle and medical debts. I just started uh, a couple of months ago going back to school to become a, to become a teacher. Uh, why? This will introduce new debt. Why? Uh, essentially to follow a passion. I started school. Uh, I graduated high school in Your, your in passion is to be a teacher in the classroom or to yeah. teach? Yep. Or to teach? Uh, to be a teacher in a classroom. Because I'm a teacher. Okay. But I didn't take a pay cut. Right. Right. Essentially, this hopefully would give me uh, better stability and, and job uh, not necessarily higher income, though it would be a, a bump based on where I teach and whatnot. But uh, yeah, what do you make now? Uh, roughly thirty-five. And what would you make in the classroom? Uh, about forty-five to sixty. So you're going to make more again, depending on where I teach. Yeah, you're going to make more than you make now. Right. I thought you were saying you would have to go down in income to work your passion. No, no, no. It would, it would, it would be a bump in income. Oh, okay. Well, why would you not do it? Yeah. 
it would it, it would introduce more debt. Oh, well, just go go debt. get your teaching certificate without going into debt. Pay cash for it. For, uh, a little tough. No, it's not. It's called work. Yeah. Lord, the way you phrased up your debt initially, you said, "Oh, we just have a little bit of debt, just fifty grand." So it tells me you're broke. Right. How um, is it a little debt if you can't afford to cash flow school because of it? Right. We we essentially live paycheck to paycheck. Um, uh, we have. What's your wife work? What's your wife work make? What's that? What's your wife make? About thirty three thousand. Okay, so you have a sixty eight thousand dollar household income, which is the average household income in America. How much Correct. is your car payment? Uh, four, four hundred or three ninety eight a month. Sell your car, and we have about twenty two thousand left on the loan. Yeah, sell your car. Okay. You're not going to do that. I can tell by the way you answered that. <laughs> See, here's the thing. You've got it in your head that you get to do all of these things at once. Keep a car you can't afford. Go get a degree you can't afford. What? Meanwhile, making the excuse of we live paycheck to paycheck, and that's an excuse. It's not a fact. Right. Sell your stinking car. Get three extra jobs. Go to the community college and get your teaching certificate and pay cash for your teaching certificate and live your dream with no additional debt. By the way, when you sell your car, cut your debt in half. Right. That would. Something for you to think about, dude. I don't know if you're going to do it or not, because I think you got this all figured out in your head that you want to go be normal. The way you're describing is normal, but I'll help you with this. Normal sucks. You're getting ready to keep a $22,000 car you can't afford and go get a degree and put another twenty-five dollars or $30,000 on top of this and get a $10,000 bump, and you're gonna, then you're going to whine that teachers don't make enough. What I'm hearing is we're already fifty grand in debt. What's another twenty, thirty, forty to get this? Well, degree? it's just this mindset that this is normal and it's it's the only way to do it. Well, it's not the only way to do it. I'll guarantee you, you can work overtime, you can work extra jobs, and you can go to the cheapest possible local university, community college, whatever it is you got to do to finish up your work to get your teaching certificate. And I want you to go be a teacher. I just don't want you to be dumb about it. Because it's, it's just going to cost you. It's going to cost you a decade of your life doing this wrong. And it really has to do with this stupid car. And it has to do with you not being willing to sacrifice and dial this down. Instead, you're just kind of going the easy way. And the easy way is always not the easy way. It's always the hard way. And the truth is, even with this bump in income, you're going to be broke again. You're not going to fix the problem. There you go. Because you've gone up in debt enough that it sucks up every bit of that new income. And so all the joy from this is going to be gone. Audrey's with us in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hey, Audrey, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How can we help? All right. Yeah. So my husband is 16 years military. And five years ago, we decided to live minimally so we can stop living paycheck to paycheck and be able to save up enough to cash flow everything. Wow. After retur- yeah, after it was a big goal. After returning from an overseas tour last year, um, we did what we never dreamed we can do. We paid cash for a seven uh, second vehicle and we paid cash for our home. Woo! Whoa, way to go. <laughs> well thank yeah. you for your service, both of you, and I'm so proud of you. Well done. Thank you for your support. We seriously never thought we'd ever be in a place like this. So my question is, we move every two to three years in the military, and is it okay if we can continue to purchase cash for a home? I mean, obviously, if they send us to California, that probably won't happen, but um, we want to continue to pay cash for a home at every assignment. Yeah. Or should we rent and just focusing on investing, which we've only started doing last year? Probably some of both, depending on where you're where you're stationed. Okay. Okay. So let me kind of give lay this out for you. Yes, if you can pay cash and you want to buy, that's fine. We generally recommend to our our brothers and sisters in the military that they not purchase. And here's why: usually during a two year or three year stay, the house does not go up enough in value to cover the cost of selling it, and you end right. up losing money from the purchase to the resale. Right. And if you're doing that with cash, that's going to hurt ouchy. Okay. Okay. Now the way you can, there's a couple things you can do to get ready to determine this. When you, once you know where you're going to be stationed next time, once you know where the move is, all right, you, A, you're going to put yours on the market and sell it for sure. No question about that. Don't yeah. leave it. Okay. So you got that yeah. money in your hand and then you start shopping in the other area. Here's the two numbers 
that will tell you um, if you if you buy or not. Okay. Now, okay. the military markets, you've been in 16 years, so you already know this, but let me just review with you, okay? Some of these uh, bases are in areas where the entire economy is the military. It's a small town. Yes, that's what And we're. so the real estate economy is driven by people like you, coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Consequently, sometimes the houses don't escalate as much because there's always a supply, always an inventory of them for sale. Yes. And so you, a lot of times in a small town, generally military economy, you're not going to do as well. But anyway, here's the numbers you look for. Ask the real estate agent to, to, to run a study off the MLS statistics for you that tells you two things. Within a five-mile radius of the house you're looking at buying, what is the average appreciation for the past five years per year? How much is it going up per year? Okay. If you're going to be there three years and it goes up 2% a year average, you're going to lose money when you resell because real estate commissions are six and closing costs. You're going to, you know, it's going to be a 10% out of pocket to resell. And so if you don't make more than 10% increase in value during the time you're there, then you're going to lose money. You follow me? Yes. So, you know, how much is the average appreciation and am I going to be here long enough to where I make money on this rather than lose money? That's thing one. The, number, okay. the second statistic is DOM, average days on the market. What is it? The houses within a five-mile radius, how quickly do they sell when they go on the market? In some of these slow markets, like I was talking to about a while ago, now right now it's weird out there. You can sell anything in a lot of places. But if the market out there is, um, yeah, there we go. If the market out there it, it is slow and it says 270 days on the market is the average time to sell a house, that's nine months. You don't buy there because that means you're going to get stuck in the thing. But if the average days on the market is 27 days, that's a hot market. Oh, by the way, where you find a slow, a low days on the market, quick sale, you're usually going to see higher appreciation rates. It's a hot market by definition. So that tells you if you can, it can and should buy in there. That's the plan. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? It's your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Three. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. We're talking about your life and your money. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. You jump in. We'll talk about your relationships, your careers, your money, your job, your boundaries. We talk about all of it here. 888-825-5225. Misty's with us in Indianapolis. Hi, Misty. How are you? I'm great. Thank you guys so much for taking my call. Sure. What's our, how can we help? So I'm calling about my son's school loan. Um, when I was first learning about the baby steps, he was getting ready to go to college. He did take out a small loan against my advice. I did not co-sign for it, but um, I did say that I would pay it back when it came time to be due because I felt bad because I had not done anything for his college. I hadn't prepared for college at all for him. I was expecting it to be in four years and I would be done with the baby steps by then. Um, unfortunately the pandemic hit, he took a semester off and never returned back to school. So in the meantime, this loan company had my bank account number because they had said if I paid a small amount each month, it would be better in the end. So they started automatically taking payments out. Um, and then within, uh, it was a year ago, he ran away from home 
which he is an adult, but I now have almost no contact with him. So I also have no ability to see what the loan amount is, what's left, how much to pay. Um, so my question is, since I said I would pay initially, should I keep paying it? Or since he left and pretty much didn't follow what I thought was going to happen. What was the balance? Should I, it was a $12,000 loan. Okay. What do you make? Uh, right now I have a really good salary. Um, I make, this past year I made 140000 So it's nothing for me to pay it mm -hmm. as of right now. Why are you estranged? Uh, Why is he not speaking to you? I'm not quite sure. He told me, I have seen him about three times in the last year. He told me it was because I was too manipulative. I believe um, that his father had gotten into his head and said, said some things because I'm actually not on quite the pushover. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not really sure. He just said he needed to be off on his own, which is fine. I, I want him to be on his own, but he's not. He's not working. He's not going to school. He just sits at his dad's house and has no relationship with me or anyone else in my family. I'm sorry. Thank That's you. Hard. Yeah. So, Misty, do you feel like the dad is enabling him to just sit around all day and putting thoughts in his head about you? Yeah. Um, yes and no. It's actually his grandma that's the enabler. Um, his dad never had a job until our son was 17 years old because his mom would pay for everything. She paid all the child support. She paid, I mean, my son would make a Christmas list and she'd buy every single thing on it. Um, he still lives with her. Oh, wait a minute. You're and not supposed to do that? 40 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm asking for I a mean, friend. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of problems when we were together, the short time we were together. He was he had pulled me away from all my friends and family, very emotional, um, yeah. emotionally. So how long, how long ago did you all divorce? Oh, um, he was, our son was one. So Okay, so, eight, so you raised ago. this boy. All his mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And so you've spoken into his life a lot more than anybody else has. He's got that yes. down inside of him. Yes. And he'll come back around. Thank you. Yeah. You've made more deposits in his bank than they have in who he is. Mm -hmm. There's more of you in him. And so he's going to come back around. Um, there's nothing wrong with either answer here. There's not a, you don't have mm -hmm. a moral thing you have to do, or certainly don't have a legal thing. You could simply mm -hmm. cut, you could simply let him know, uh, until you and I are in a relationship, I am not going to pay your loan. Okay. You could tell him that and then just cut the, cut the draft off, block it and mm -hmm. don't let him take money out of your account. And then it'll just sit there and build until his grandmother pays it or he pays it or whatever. Right. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. At all. Uh, it really, he, he probably doesn't care cause he's probably not going to do anything about it right now. Exactly. He'll just roll his eyes and go, oh, mom's trying to, you know, jerk my chain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. The other option, of course, is just to say, you know what? It's 12,000 bucks. Screw it. Yeah. I'm just going to pay it. I'm going to write a yeah. check, be done with it. And, um, and I'm never going to bring it up again. Mm -hmm. If you're going to pay it, you cannot use it as leverage ever. You just got to let okay. it go. That's an act of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. on your part and you're just gonna go not 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 like you're trying to buy his love or you're trying to win him back you're never going to bring it up again you it's not leverage mm -hmm. if you're going to use his leverage don't pay it off okay okay because that's not good for you to sit and stew mm -mm. over that okay so that's just old man ramsey talking okay so that's just it has nothing to do with money is just let him go let them let the whole thing go and when he comes back around someday he'll go Oh, mom, whatever happened with that loan? I just paid it, honey. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And just don't bring it up because you don't want to feed into this narrative of you being manipulative. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and honestly, um, I'm a little softer in my old age. I probably would do option two. Yeah. Is what I, Dave Ramsey would probably do today. I'd probably just pay it, not because I'm trying to win their love back, not because I'm trying to get attention, because I'm not going to bring it up. But because if you're going to do all that, you're going to be disappointed because he's not mm -hmm. going to come back around. He's not going to like you because of this. He's not going to. None of that's going to work. OK, but just mm -hmm. to let him go, set him free. 
and then he'll swoop back around and it 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 every day that he doesn't is painful for you but he'll come back around mom thank you and I think you paying this off is going to set you free in even yeah. bigger way. Yeah. Because I think, I think every time you, you pay it, you get mad again. <laughs> yes, I do. I would. It would piss me off like every month for a few minutes. I got to reset my brain now. <laughs> I'm going to kill the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill his father. I'm going to kill my ex-mother-in-law. I'm going to kill all of them. Okay. Now I got to have my coffee and I'm going to work. Okay. <laughs> oh, you did that, did you? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, th- this is worth $12,000 to not have this conversation in your head every month. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You're right. S- set yourself free. And, Miss, do you still have access to all these accounts? You were saying something earlier about... No, he, no she I can't, do not. She can't get it. But, well, how are you going to pay it off? That's what I'm wondering. I don't know. I mean... Yeah. Guess you'll have to contact the student loan well, servicer. Why don't you call them and just say, I know you can't tell me the amount, but... Um, but I need you to draft the amount out of my account this month to pay it off. Can you do that? <laughs> okay, I'll try that. And then make sure there's 15000 bucks laying in there so that you're ready. Oh, mm. uh, man, that's a hard one. Yeah, that's so hard. Yeah. Uh, this is The Ramsey Show. Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper. Jumpstart your CFO career. Three. Well, sadly, one of the things you hear on this show ever so often is stress and anxiety. All kinds of different things, certainly around money. But people have experienced all kinds of anxiety and loneliness and stress lately. Here's the good news. Our own Ramsey personality, Dr. John Deloney, has a brand new book out. I am so excited. We actually got them in today. I got to hold one of them in my hands. It is, it's a great book. Now, of course, I read the manuscript months ago as we were developing the book, but uh, it, it comes out in April. It's on pre-sale right now. It's called Own Your Past, Change Your Future. It's selling fast. Everybody wants and needs to know about Dr. Loney's, Dr. Deloney's not-so-complicated approach to relationships, mental health, and wellness, and you're in for a treat. When you eat, read this, you're going to laugh, you're going to cry, you're going to be challenged, I did, I was. And you'll be transformed. How to deal with different types of trauma, how to get connected into a community, and the steps that you take to change your thoughts and actions. Yes, you can own your past and change your future. So when you pre-order today, you'll get free bonus items. includes a month of free one-on-one therapy, weekly therapy through our partners at BetterHelp. Who does this? This is a great bargain. All for just pre-ordering a $20 book. Oh, and you get the ebook and the audiobook as well, read by the author. So check it out. Own Your Past, Change Your Future. It's on pre-sale right now, $20 at RamseySolutions.com. So, George, the scams are up. I'm seeing on this article that our producer James handed us on the uh, 
Dad blames student loans. The Federal Trade Commission's warning about an increase in these scams. Yeah, this is bad. And uh, of course, they're preying on people's confusion and people are getting stressed about student loan pause being unpaused. And so they're saying the federal government put federal student loan payments on pause during the pandemic. With that pause expiring, people are anxious and the scammers are swooping in. They're promising to reduce payments or even cancel student debt entirely if you give them your credit card number. They use social media, text messages, phone calls, and the scripts are convincing. Some of them even sound like they're coming I, I from the government. This. Hi, this is Shay with SLA Servicing. We're in the process of pre-enrollment for all loan forgiveness. It's going to be a bit more challenging as deadlines come, and so we'll need your credit card to be able to get this You'd done. You'd be a great scammer, Dave. Man, I'll tell you what. You've got to put the radio voice on to do that, right? Here we go. Oh, so man, that's this so is scummy. Bad. And so I want to give people some quick tips and tools to avoid getting scammed. Number one, if a student loan servicer calls you, it's probably a scam. Generally, these <laughs> they don't work that hard. are not calling you. <laughs> They've got better things to do. So some red flags you got to look out for if they're asking you for your username and password, if they're asking you for banking information. If you've already given your payment information, call your bank, put a hold on that account immediately so they can't get any more money. You can report all of this stuff to the Federal Trade Commission, the, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, your state attorney general. Don't fall for this stuff. Yeah. It, it, let me just tell you, it's a good rule. Here, here's a basic thing on scam avoidance, and you've done a lot of this stuff on fine print. If someone that you already are doing business with, like you have a student loan, you have a credit card, you shouldn't, but you have a debit card, you have a credit card, you have a you you have an IRS account, and they call you up and say, this is Joe with the IRS. To verify that we're talking with the right person, would you please give us your social security number? The IRS never does that. They already have your social security number. They don't need to ask you. Your bank does not. We need to verify. Would you give us your your uh, your credit card number? <laughs> no, I won't. You should already have that. If I already am doing business with, you know, we need your we need to verify your bank information. And we're with uh, Sally Mae. Um, no, you should probably already have my bank information, and so they'll never ask that kind of stuff. So this just this should the red flag should go off, the siren should go off, the beep 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 ought to be going off when you hear that. I just stuff. don't answer phone calls these days; they're usually no good. But here's what you can do: I got a call from Russia. Tell me about my stu- my uh, extended warranty. Your car's extended warranty, yeah. Dave. Yeah, I don't think they're worried about that right now. They got bigger problems. But here's the thing: the I, what ID I want people said to Russia. Do. Oh yeah, on my phone. I got that too. Are we getting the same call? Yeah. Wow. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. A lot of these places can spoof the exact number. They can spoof the sheriff's office. They can spoof the IRS number. So even if you get a call and it's it's the same number as the IRS, go to the IRS website, check the phone number, and you call them back because that way you avoid running into that situation. Yeah. And so like – we had a uh, a couple of people on get scammed or almost get scammed or whatever here uh, that was a call from the local sheriff's department. And when you called their number back that they left, it was the exact recording. They had taken a recording from the sheriff's department and put it over there with the same phone tree and everything. Yeah. But if you call the sheriff's department, they would say, oh, no, there's a scam going around. Don't talk to those people. Don't go over there and pay parking fees that you don't owe. Or don't go over there and you know there's not an arrest warrant out for you, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. So you got to you got to hang up and call back directly, not the number the scammer gives you, but the actual number that you have. And then you'll find out, oh, that really wasn't a real person. That was Shay is in somewhere in some Slavic company country yep. or whatever. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't fall for this stuff guys. And yeah. I know people are stressed and when you're stressed, it can get you to be panicked and you start making poor decisions. Well, I tell you, there's two times people get scammed. Okay. When you're afraid and desperate and when you're greedy, mm. like if you think you're going to get something free and easy, people fall for that one too. And so student loan forgiveness is the free and easy thing. Yeah. So. They go, oh, well, forgive your student loans, but you need to send us $200 to verify. Yeah. That's well, a scam. No, or just, I just need your credit card number so we can get the account set up to get this going. And I'm like, well, if you're going to forgive it, why do you need the number? And yeah. So, if it yeah. seems too good to be true, it's too it good. It is. Don't do it. Yeah. There you go. Good stuff. That's happening. It's happening out there right this second. And it usually comes with IRS stuff or the other ones that come up are people collecting uh, money for charities for um, war-torn countries and mm. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yep. it's a problem. Mark is with us. Mark is in Houston, Texas. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good. How are you all doing? Better than I deserve. What's up? All right, uh, I got a question. Pre- appreciate y'all taking my call. Sure. Um, so I have a 600,000 20-year term life insurance policy. I have a seven-year-old son 
who lives with uh, me and my wife, my current wife. Uh, his mom is uh, we're uh, divorced, and she if if I pass, he goes with her. So my question is, how should I split up, or should I split up my life insurance policy? Like, how, how do I take care of my wife if I pass and my son? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you can have the beneficiary be a percentage, and you can say 50% to your current wife, 50% to your son. Okay. Now, I personally, if I were in your situation, would not leave the money to your son with your ex-wife in charge. That just rings of all kinds of bad medicine to me. So I would set up a, uh, a trust, a family trust, that is formed upon your death, and the money is funded into that trust. So the beneficiary for your son is son's family trust, whatever you name it, right? You name it, okay? Give it a little name. And you set up a little trust, and it's formed upon your death. The trust never happens if you don't die. Until, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you don't die before, while he's a minor, okay? If it, when he's a grown person, you'll just leave him the money if you want to or not. But uh, when he's a kid, you're going to leave some money for his, to care for him. And you can even, you can set whoever you want up as the trustee to manage it. Your brother, your mother, your current wife, whoever you want to leave to make sure the money is distributed to your child to take care of your child out of the trust. But I would not just leave Three hundred thousand bucks to the ex-wife to manage. That, yeah, I wouldn't need. <laughs> yeah, that just sounds like a bad. And if you leave it to the kid, she's going to be managing it because she's the guardian. Mm-hmm. So don't leave it to the kid. Leave it to a trust to take care of the kid, and the trustee makes sure that money is managed according to the trust. And so you can set it up to be however you want to do it. You can do 50, 50, 60, 40. You can say 400,000, 200,000. You can call it whatever you want to do. I don't care, uh, whichever way you want to do it. Um, and, but a beneficiary, a primary beneficiary can be more than one entity by percentages or by amounts. And for a minor child, I recommend family trust. Yeah, good reminder there that it, it, putting a seven-year-old as the beneficiary isn't going to work because they can't accept that money at seven years old. You well, have to be over 18. It goes into their name, but the guardian would be in charge of it. Yeah. And that would be the ex. Yikes. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit. Whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com. Three. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. Open phones at 888-825-5225. We're glad you are here. David is in Jacksonville. Hi, David. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave and uh, uh, George. How y'all doing? Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? I uh, got a question. I uh, wanted to see what you would do if you were in my shoes. Uh, currently, um, I have a $34,000 student loan. Uh, we're following the baby steps. I call it baby step 2.5, but actually we're in three. 
Um, I have about 11000 uh an emergency fund. And I'm on a loan forgiveness program that after 10 years uh, for public service for the state, the the last of the loan is forgiven, so that would give me about seventeen thousand. I only have five more years to pay on it. Should I just continue making the minimal payments on that, and just have the last of it forgiven, or be able, to, if I have the ability now, to go ahead and pay the thing, you know, and get it paid off here in probably the next year or two? The program that you're engaged in has been has proven to be an absolute scam. Here's the actual okay. numbers on the public service loan forgiveness program. So far, 726,811 people have applied for what you're applying for. 700,000 people. To date, 8,000 have been granted it. 1%. Okay, that's a (laughs) no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, if if you, this was happening six months from now and you were about done with it, I'd say, all right, let's ride it out. But five years from now, it's a long time when you could pay this thing off in a year and move on with your life and be in a totally different place financially instead of hoping and putting your hope in someone else's uh, control. Yeah, this is one of the times that the government completely lied. Um has it happened before, Dave? You said one of the times. I said one of the times. Wow. One of the many times. But okay, course, there we go. Of course they've lied. But they, uh, this, this, this is a complete and utter scam. There are three types of student loan forgiveness, uh, and this is the type that people sign up for and that has not worked. Now, student loan forgiveness in the event of disability is actually occurring. Student loan forgiveness, uh, when the you you know, take a, like a tech school and the tech school scams you and closes down truck driving school or whatever, uh, that loan is forgiven. The, those are forgiven. And when you die, student loans are forgiven. But, uh, uh, and, and so those types of loans have that, that, that type of forgiveness program has actually worked, but the, uh, public student loan forgiveness program is an abs public service loan forgiveness program is an absolute horrid scam. 1.16% of the people who have signed up for it and counted on it have actually gotten it. It's a 99% fail rate. Wow. Yeah, we did a deep dive on that very specific topic on the Borrowed Future podcast in episode six, Don't Bank on Student Loan Forgiveness. It's about 40 minutes long, and it's worth the listen, David, if you need some encouragement to go ahead and pay these loans off and move on with your life. Yeah, it's the Borrowed Future is the documentary that we put out on student loans, but we also, before we did that, put out an eight-series a podcast that you were the host of. Yeah, it was so, eye-opening. Yeah, so po- borrowed future. If you want to learn about what's really going on in the student loan world, it is. It's really a dark, dark world. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's nasty. There's about a thousand villains you can point at in the story. Too many. Too many to a count. A good story needs one, maybe two villains, but this one has everything from Congress to banks to parents and guidance counselors, <sighs> and student loan companies. I, I mean, I could keep going. Colleges, I mean, universities, yeah. I mean, it's just like there's a villain on every corner. Braden is in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Braden. How are you? Hey, George. Hey, Dave. I'm good. How are you guys? Better than we deserve, man. What's up? Awesome. Hallelujah. Um, So I kind of, I'm I'm in this stage of my life where I've never been this busy. A lot of moving parts. Um, My fiance and I are getting married a month from today. Yay! Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so excited. We're excited. Um. We come from a little bit different um, financial background. We're both new in our careers. We both have student loans. Uh, She's currently in a car lease that's up in December. We don't live together. We're obviously we're waiting until we get married. And I just I I just finished the Total Money Maker. I'm excited about or makeover. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. It's okay. You're fine. You're doing good. Um, We just I, I just I'm excited. I'm fired up. I just don't know how to move about. Um, setting the right kind of money aside for a car purchase that she's going to need that we're going to need to make later this year. And as well as how to, how to get started in this plan together and how to get us both on the same page with um, the aspect of being excited and ready to make sacrifices. If that makes sense. Have you talked about all this? Yeah. 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 We talked about it, but do you, do you, like, do you feel like you're philosophically aligned, but the details aren't, is all you're missing. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't convincing. I, I, for example, yeah. <laughs> for, uh, I guess for example, you know, she, she think I tell her let's let's sell some stuff, save and hibernate, and get rid of our college debt. And she's thinking, let's do a road trip in this month, and let's go out and put some money aside. She's, this is she's the definition of just, not being aligned philosophically. <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I guess the, the fact that she's in a car is kind of is a little bit different yeah. than I would do. Yeah. Well, not that. It's just it's it's not about where you are. It's about what you're going to do about where you are. You want to sell some stuff, get out of debt, pile up some cash to buy her a car. She wants to go on a road trip. So this is what we're going to do about where we are. Where we are is one thing, but what we're going to do about it is what's scary. And and you are on polar opposites on that. Are you guys doing any pre-marriage counseling? We are. We are. We're almost towards the end of it right now, but I guess we haven't covered finances yet. Yeah, you need to. Well, Braden, I want to do you a favor. I'm going to give you a wedding gift. I'm going to give you one year to Ramsey Plus, and it will give you access to all of the videos in Financial Peace University. Both of you. And you have to do it together. That's the promise you're going to make me. You're going to build your first budget together with every dollar plus, and you're going to put all your income, all the expenses, and we're going to get some goals on paper about what we're going to do as a couple, we, with both of our money, once we combine our income. So if that doesn't get on the same page, there's going to be some deeper issues here, maybe some some more counseling. But I think if you get her excited about what the future could look like without debt, maybe she'd be okay putting off the road trip until we pay off all our loans. And we yeah. use that to celebrate. Yeah, the answer is not read the total money makeover. Hey, let's sell your car. No, that that doesn't usually go well. So um, instead we go, all right, well, let's look at our future together and what's the best way to get there. And so you're, okay. uh, if, you got, if you're getting good pre, in-depth pre-marriage counseling, they're going to go there, and they should have already before one month from the wedding, honestly. But um, dig into yeah. that. You guys start talking about this because here's the thing, and here's how you can couch it to her. The number one cause of divorce in North America today, the number one thing couples fight about, money and money problems. Yes, sir. Getting, if you get on the same page about money right now, you're going to save yourself heartache in the area that is the number one problem in marriage. That's pretty cool. If you can get rid of the number one problem, then all that's left are the other ones. <laughs> yes, sir. That's okay. a big deal. I mean, if the number yeah. one way that, you know, that, that whatever, that you did something, you'd always just go do the number. Get, get that one out of the way. So you guys get on the same page. Take the, take the uh, subscription, and the two of you start watching some of the videos instead of binge-watching Netflix. Okay. And... um Start going through Financial Peace University. If you can find a church in your area that's teaching it, get in the class. And you can go back through it as many times as you want during this year. We're going to give you a one-year subscription as a wedding gift. But please don't do it by yourself and then go in and try to explain it to her. It's going to get you, that's going to get you murdered. Dave says is two of the, the worst words in a marriage. Yeah, and well, and I just learned this, and so I'm going to tell you where you're stupid. That's not a good plan, okay? No, 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 no. Get her with you. Make this her idea and your idea, and the two of us together are going to tackle the world. You need a shared vision. You need common language, and that's why Financial Peace University is so powerful. It's not magical content. It just gets you on the same page where you can talk about things and understand each other, and then do some math and go, here's what we're spending in interest that we're throwing away towards lenders that could gone towards the next road trip so use all of those things in combination and see if that has her turn a corner yeah and don't bring us up again until you're watching the stuff don't say what dave said or i read this book that's just suicide it doesn't work so congratulations we're excited for you man so and kelly kelly's up. gonna pick up we're gonna get you guys signed up for this as our gift First Peter 3.15, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 
but do this with gentleness and respect. Jim Rohn says, if you say something and back it up with your actions, you will provide the proof for people who are listening to you, and they will much more willingly follow your lead. Amen. Open phones this hour. George Camel, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. Amber is with us in uh, San Francisco. Hi, Amber. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Better than we deserve. What's up? Um, okay, so I had a question that's a little bit complicated. Uh, you would have to know a little bit of my background to like know where I'm coming from. Basically, I'm getting kicked out of my... Uh, grandmother's house in a month not because of anything i've done i pay rent and everything she just wants her own house to herself uh going to you know my parents moved up to uh, idaho all the way up in bonner Ferry, uh in november and uh like our uh our relationship is not there uh basically when i was 12 they put me to work full-time uh for their company, construction company, for absolutely no pay up until I was 20. And I got injured, and I said, that's it, I'm done. Like, I'm an adult. Uh, they knew that the uh, expenses weren't going to go under their names because I was an adult. So I racked up medical bills trying to get, uh, basically trying to get uh, better. So I have two jobs right now, which is in and out in Starbucks. And... Uh, I just got injured a week ago and like I have all of this financial pressure on me right now and I'm not exactly sure what to do. How old are I've, you? I've, I'm 23 now. Okay. What part of San Francisco are you in? Uh, I am on the, uh, the east part of San Francisco. Okay. Living with my grandmother. Yeah, but for only for one more month. And you work at Starbucks and only where else? For one month. And in and out Starbucks and where? In and out Burger. In and out, sir. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, my question was because I bought two of your books. It was like, how can I, basically, how can I do more and save more with the situation that I have right now? Okay. Well, um, this sounds very lonely to me. And and, uh, and and a little scary. You're probably pretty scared, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> oh. very much so. Okay. Well, a couple of observations that are um, obvious, but I'm just going to say them out loud so we're all dealing with the same hand of cards here. One, you don't make much money because your jobs suck. Two, uh, you live in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> so um, one of the things I'm going to want to do mathematically is to help adjust that some way or another. Uh, do you have relatives that are uh, friendly, not that you live with, but that would give you some emotional support in any other area of the country? Um, I do have two brothers living here, but one of them is actually going to go move up near my parents and take a job there. I I. I refuse to move up north because, like, at 23, I received my first paycheck ever. I'm, like, I, I, I'm not asking that. you to move in with your parents. It wasn't what I was suggesting. Okay. I'm just trying to get some emotional support around you and somebody to walk with you because what you're describing to me is terrifying. Yeah. Um, I could. Uh, the only closest thing that I have right now is my uh, my uncle that lives here. And they all live there. Your brother, your Correct. uncle, your grandmother. Yes, my brother, my uncle, and my grandmother. And your parents and your other brother moved to Idaho. Okay. All right. Correct. Well, here's what I would tell you to do. You need community. Um, and if um, if you were my long-lost niece and you called me, uh, I would say let's get you into a good church where you can get some people around you that love you and will walk with you and get some quality humans in your life that are walking with you uh, because you're processing all the pain of your childhood and the distrust of your parents. Um, but we've, number one, you need a great career track. Right now you're, you're trying to just survive as a barista, and barista jobs are not set up for survival. They're set up for supplement at best. 
And so we need to get a, a good job that makes a lot more money. And so let's start talking right. about new career, new job, full-time jobs that aren't fast food uh, as soon as possible, making more money. Um, and then obviously you've got to look for a place to live, don't you? Yes. I've been looking out of state and just having friends feel like, hey, can you loan me some money? That way I can make it and I'll pay you back when I'm actually set up. Because California, I can't do it. Okay. So you're thinking of leaving California? Correct. It's okay. too expensive. Do you, have, you, do you have any money at all? I have about 1500 in savings right now. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, because you can go work those two types of jobs in other cities in America, and it change change your living situation severely. Um, so, um, but you know, I, being a nanny, walking dogs, you'll make more than you're making now. Okay. Um, you know, doing anything that that moves the needle on the money piece that's legal and moral and doesn't put you in harm's way um, is what we've got to look at. And yeah, I'm I'm really up for you leaving San Fran just because it's so stinking expensive, and it doesn't sound like you got a, an emotional support system there anyway. And so uh, I'm gonna pick out a city and I'm gonna move and make it happen. And no, you don't need to borrow a bunch of money. And you don't even need to take a whole bunch of uh, personal items with you. You got a car? No, I do not. Do you have a driver's license? Unfortunately, I do not. Okay. Why? I, I had left their uh, I, I had left their household back in November, October. It was kind of a rough situation, so I said I'm going to go make it on my own because I have. Nothing to my name. So have you ever driven a car? I have. My brother and I have practiced, but I have been out uh, with an injury, and I've been working all the time. I've been just working, putting my head down and working nonstop. I'm so sorry, Amber. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of trauma that you haven't dealt with that I think needs to be a part of this equation as you move and get new jobs. I think there's a lot here that you've got to unpack with a great counselor, a great therapist to walk with you. And I also want to send you a copy of Ken Coleman's book from Paycheck to Purpose to help you get on that path to a career that you love, making great money doing it so that we can turn the situation around. So I'll have Kelly pick up. So and if I'm you, I'm getting out of yellow pad and I'm going to start making some survival lists. What are the three things I have to do right now? I've got to get my income up, I've got to get a driver's license, and I've got to find a place to live. Those are survival things that you need to do right now, this week. You need to go get your driver, take your driver's license test and get, get pa passed, and then you need to be working like a maniac. Anything you can do, 70, 80 hours a week for this month that you've got with your grandmother, go crazy. And if you can get her to give you one more month just to say, I've got to pile up some cash so I can get out of here, grandmother, I get it. I know you want the house. I know you want me out of here. I'm out of here. But if you'll give me one more month, I can save up the money to get me a little car, and I'm going to load it up, and I'm going to head east out of California and go find a less expensive place to live than San Francisco and start your life and start a career and start some education and get some counseling for all the things that have happened to you and start to start the healing process plug into a good church along the way but right now you need a driver's license you need a car you need six jobs right now so you can pile up as much money to solve this as fast as possible you need sustainability that's what we're after i'm so sorry kiddo you call back if we can help you we'll try this is the ramsey show We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's Rachel Cruz, co-host on The Ramsey Show. If you want to do your debt-free scream live on the show, visit RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. We'd love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. That's RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. 